Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, Interpretable Machine Learning for Enterprise Applications. We have two speakers today from Grid Dynamics and Stanley Black and Decker. And before we get started, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. So please note that your console is fully customizable and you can expand or collapse um, any screens. And also note that the, um, there's going to be two sessions today. So at the end of the first session, uh, right at 2.30 in Eastern time, you'll see a button pop up and it's gonna take you over to the second portion of today's webinar. And we will answer all questions at the um, end of the presentation. So be sure to submit them in the Q&A panel on your screen. And we'll also be sending out the recording for today's presentation. So you should receive that in the next couple of days. And at this time, I'll turn it over to our first speaker. Hey, everyone. This is Prabhakar. I'm the uh, director of uh, data science at uh, Stanley Black & Decker. And here's a quick preview of my experience. I have a bunch of experience in healthcare. I've been in automotive uh, industry, remarketing, and industrial distribution and manufacturing. Today, I'll be primarily talking about uh, how we implemented uh, demand forecasting and specifically for demand forecasting how we implemented an AI ML framework and what type of problem is it solving, how big is it, and when push comes to shove, we go into production, um, what are the issues that we have to deal with, some of the interpret interpretability elements. So as we, as we talk about this, I'll talk about all the challenges of doing this at scale and doing this for a very, very large portfolio. Stanley Black & Decker, as you can see, a lot of these brands you will recognize, but one thing that's common between all of them is they belong to Stanley Black & Decker. And this is a huge portfolio of products. And not just these brands, you also start to see where um, we have security solutions, hospitality, healthcare, and uh, fastening solutions and infrastructure products. So at the end of the day, any demand forecasting work that we have to do has to go across all of these different elements of the business. And what one of the core challenges that we have is, after, you know, all the complexity of these brands included, we have about 100,000 products. And based on how we forecast them, we almost have like 2.1 million demand forecasting units that we have to forecast across the globe. So as we go through this particular large challenge, what we see is, we we are now looking at a extremely large system where we have to provide the visibility of all the demand forecasts that we're generating. And we have to, again, make it easy to consume all of that insight across all of these queues. And when we first do the transition, we have to make a case for transformation, not just for moving to ML model, but we have to handle physical business transformation that spans across the globe. So let's start with a very basic notion of why we even need to do demand forecasting. So demand forecasting is all about predicting customer demand. And when we think about what we do, uh, what we do with demand forecasting in the grand scheme of things, demand forecasting is essentially our way of establishing the baseline of which you measure actual orders and the company then builds, uh, puts cash into the business and then they build inventory and that inventory is built on the back of uh, you know working with the suppliers and the whole ecosystem that's created that's that exists to support the creation of the product and the resources and capacity all come together all to uh, to basically fulfill the demand so it's in the grand scheme of things that's where demand forecasting lies and as you think about it right one always has to ask like why do I need to do AIML? We've all done demand forecasting in the past. There's very advanced statistical algorithms. What's different? So one of the things that's really different about the AIML formulation of this problem is the fact that you now bring the formulation itself to a single structure. You take advantage of uh, data structures where everything is considered as a time series signal and you bring together a feature library that uh, is used to augment your understanding of uh, data science. Uh, 
from a data science perspective, what are the things that impact your uh, forecasts? And one thing that's really different is how the features are handled from an ML perspective. The, the statistical forecast, uh, typically the older algorithms that we, when we think about them, you still have to apply them from an individual time series perspective. And sure, there are algorithms like, uh, you know, Varimax or VAR algorithm where you can build a model across all the time series together, but they fundamentally don't handle all the problems that are uh, that are core to solving a multi-time series time series problem. And the AIML formulation handles that really well. Then, the, but consequently, some of the things like model optimization, data size then some of the inside infrastructure and potentially how the algorithms potentially fail, all of those become new challenges now that you have to deal with as you go through this exercise. So let's start with what makes the problem itself very challenging. Now, data availability and agility. Everybody wants to use every piece of data and the new buzzword of big data where you want to build this uh, properly and you want to add all the features in the world and have this very, uh, you know, seemingly non-connected phenomena drive your forecast and suddenly you have like a crystal ball, right? In reality, it doesn't happen that way. In reality, you have to invest and improve the quality of every single one of your time series to bring it together. You have to have a time series transformation system that you have to build where you look at all of these signals and you're trying to bring them together as a into a single feature library and how you do that, how, what's the timing, what's the quality of the data, all of those pieces matter. And the other part that's really important is from a formulation perspective, if you just purely look at time series, you kind of miss the larger impact of a product's life cycle itself on, on the forecast. So to, if you just think of a time series model and build a time series model, there are larger implications that can be learned from across products to understand where a particular product is in its life cycle or what is the associated adoption with a time with a particular uh, product. All of those elements of a product's life cycle also need to be inclu included when you're doing demand forecasting system. The other thing is, of course, the basic stuff, like you have to account for all the uh, issues with the time series patterns, whether they're stationary, whether it's seasonal, trended, whether it, it when it's irregular, it's uh, fluctuating, or whether it's um, intermittent. There are times when uh, you think of uh, over time, that even the distribution is not constant, and that's what stationary is. Intermittency basically means there's zero demand events, and seasonality is a repetition of patterns, and Fluctuating is basically a, a pure a full change in direction or a change in um, trending that happens over uh, a inconsistent period of time. So all of these little uh, elements now have to be accounted for in the model. And as you build, now since you're building an ML formulation and you want to do cross-validation across time, you now have to build a separate design of how uh, cross-validation happens. Notice these are all design elements that happen while you are making the transition to AIML. And then you start to talk about the accuracy metrics and how you have to now start using uh, non-scale dependent uh, metrics to go across multi-time series because magnitudes of the different time series themselves have an impact on how the accuracy is calculated. And when you try to build a accuracy metric that goes across say a thousand, 10,000, a million different time series, the way you weigh the way or the way you handle the error term. And when you run the optimization algorithm on top of the error, error term so that you find the best model parameters, it changes how the results happen, and you could penalize smaller magnitude terms versus larger magnitude terms, and you have to start to then think about an accuracy metric that balances up. Now, then comes AutoML. There's a lot of um, opportunity now to, once you've scaled the approach on the data side, 
made uh, the uh, created the set of features that can handle and record uh, certain elements of the data, like uh, seasonality, potentially a uh, derivation window of features that represents how uh, you can think about autocorrelation. All of those elements, once you think through the on the data side, then it comes to AutoML engines. Now, um, we use uh, DataRobot on our side as the AutoML engine, apart from our own custom algorithms that we run along with it. But what happens is AutoML, uh, one of the key challenges while using AutoML is to, when you bring it in, you almost have to understand, uh, you know, people who build the AutoML have their habits incorporated into AutoML. So you have to always take a, a very deep look at the AutoML engine you're using, and there are ways to take advantage of all the automation advantage it brings and all of the best practices it brings, but also be very, very understanding of the, of the limitations of said approach and ensure that you are not fixing a hyperparameter that is now a hyperparameter because of how the engine works. So you have to be very careful. The other thing is um, AutoML engines, as as they start uh, you know, evaluating a lot of models, the size of the data set, that's the input to this exercise also matters and how you manage it and so that you don't end up uh, biasing the AutoML approach. Or you put things like shorter history time series with long history time series together in the same project and then you end up with a mix of skews where the error term you select might penalize one type of skew versus the other. And the choice of models, everything that you de derive might be for a subset of models, uh, it might be you know, underperforming on a subset of models. That's where you might have to think about creative ways of uh, grouping the time series before they go into AutoML engines and things like that. So, that's the that's one of the key design elements as you think about it. So when somebody now builds a crystal ball, now the question is what goes into the crystal ball, right? And I won't go into all the technical details, but I'll talk about how these are designed for downstream interpretability and, uh, and integration with our business teams. So a lot of uh, what we do with the feature expansion engine is a lot about how do we create features to address all the data related issues, like the life cycle issues, the different features associated with different things that impact the prediction itself, which is the feature engine that you see here on the left. And what are the different uh, uh, scaling and uh, those issues, how are they gonna get handled in the sampling? All of those things get tagged upfront in the feature expansion engine. The correlation causality engine is our way of taking that feature set and creating a connection between all of our features and the connection at various slacks so that beforehand we do an analysis of um, what features we could reduce way before going into the analysis itself. And we have uh, a halo cannibalization engine which basically takes the correlation and causality connection and identifies the subset of uh, time series that basically are, they have a halo impact. What a halo impact is defined basically as a, you have correlation at a particular lag and that correlation is uh, granular causality tested and if we find causality, then the direction of correlation, if it's, uh, if it's one grows and the other uh, decreases, there's a negative correlation, then uh, it's a cannibalization impact, but it's a halo impact if it's positively correlated. So we have those types of engines that uh, do more with the time series and tag them beforehand and become the source of explanation. So when we get this result out, what we additionally, what we're doing is as we find shorter history time series, we do imputation to basically fill up the history for those uh, skews where there's not enough history. So we artificially create synthetic history so that we take into account things like the life cycle of a particular uh, skew 
we take that uh, history from those queues that have had a longer history, and we find shorter history queues that form similar patterns. So using the clustering engine, we also have a low, generalized low rank based imputation engine. These two together create uh, imputed time series for us where we have to deal with really short uh, history time series. So all of these together then go through the custom modeling engine and they go through the auto ML modeling engine simultaneously and then we pick the best model out of both exercises through an external uh, engine. And sometimes we even look at the possibility of creating an ensemble across both engines. And after all of that, we produce the best batch of forecasts for the best model, of, uh, through best model selection across all of this. Now, for about 5,000 uh, plus time series, we run close to like 800,000 uh, models. And we've uh, pushed uh, the envelope on how we code this in Spark to do this um, you know, in like seven or eight hours versus taking several days to push the, uh, to do more. And we are making further investments to increase the scaling of the algorithm so that we could handle two and a half million time, time series in, in a few hours. As we go through this exercise, one of the things that uh, is really key to this exercise is the meta-analysis engine. And it's basically the idea that you built a model now you take all of the tags you generated through the first three exercises and use that as a way to explain how the overall modeling strategy is picking the winner and what are the driving forces. So when we do a one variable, to uh, single variable and bivariable partial dependency plots, we are now able to show the sweet spots for the models to get implemented. And that's a very good way to communicate with the business to share that. Now, one thing is, as you go through this, we have a lot, a lot of uh, code as we build through this, and uh, all of it is about, you know, the backfilling of the history and how we bring uh, skills together, and all of it takes into account the key things we talked about in the first half. What are the things with demand forecasting? And as we go through this, uh, we per our roadmap is all about how do you take the business from a thoughtful action that's now a basic uh, insight-driven process, and you take it into the future. We start to do basically automated integrations, and we do a forecast value-added analysis that's downstream that actually takes an existing statistical system applies our recommendation as an adjustment so that it gets adjusted to our forecast number. But we take every element of the demand planning process and incrementally calculate the value add. So that gives us a clean framework to identify the amount of value we've added through this exercise. So now, what does the mutual operating model look like? We have a very uh, focused operating model where we engage the business and then do the ideation. So when, as we build through this process, all the hypotheses that were generated that led to the, the analysis of the features and the different demand patterns and the picking of the, uh, all of that, picking of the right accuracy metrics. We did in the first three phases in the development, we really scaled out all the elements of design that uh, led to us building a full end-to-end -end pipeline uh, in, uh, in a CICD framework on AWS. And that's also partly one of the reasons that, uh, one of the reasons we chose it was for future scalability as we scale to more and more time CD. Now, as from a big picture perspective, I think I always hear of uh, people using forecasts as a way to say, hey, how is the feature gonna like, give me a precise answer? But the goal of forecasting is not really to predict the future. It's basically to understand that baseline that lets you take a meaningful action. And this understanding this piece is really important because as you come together and you look at the overall picture in which demand planning and forecasting fit together, it's a very small part of it. What the real uh, activity is strategy 
basically uses forecasting as a baseline to understand given current course and trajectory where we will end up. The goal for a company is what is uh, the goal for a company is the goal for the company. And then the delta between the strategy and the baseline, strategy outcome expected and the baseline is what you need to do more planning for. And you basically fulfill the delta through more strategy and planning. And you go back to the analysis on your results, if it worked, if it didn't work, and then you wash and repeat. So in that sense, Forecasting is not the end in itself. It's the means to do better organization planning. Now, the new trillion dollar question seems to be COVID-19. And um, you know some of the key things to take care of during this particular situation is um, all models are like, likely to be wrong, especially if they come from a place where you're a data scientist and you go, oh, uh, I didn't do any previous training in epidemiology, but I'm still going to go build a forecast. It doesn't work that way. A lot of uh, research needs to be done, and you need to kind of engage experts as you build these. And then uh, every time you want to establish a forecast number, you should express the level of uncertainty that you have with this, and also communicate um, you know, what is your expertise on the matter itself so that people ha understand what is uh, your uh, background and how much work have you done to understand uh, the model that before you can add to it. And also be as transparent as possible. If you are just making a time series prediction, then that's also a something, also something that you need to be very transparent about these things. Now for models that are already deployed, I think the, the key thing is always, you know, first keep your data scientists healthy because they need to be they need to be there to ensure that the models don't break. Then the right thing to do is to prioritize the models to monitor based on the amount of business impact. If there's a, one of the other things is that uh, if the always check if the main uh, hypotheses of the model implementation has changed altogether. For example, if you are building the model from the perspective that there is a main customer in, for example, the industrial sector. And that was the main roster of customers. Now, knowing how the industrial sector has really, really been impacted in the last three months, to continue to use the model would be folly if that's the data and that's what it's based on. Because the, the whole industry is not the same. That sector is not the same. Then also check for anomalies, because one of the things that is going to happen is you can make a prediction. But one of the biggest things that's going to change is you have to train often. And you have to ensure that um, that the anomalies are all addressed and also that the original hypothesis hasn't changed. And as you set up the problem going forward, you have to ensure priority. You have to prioritize visibility and the accuracy of the data itself. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this Data Points webinar presented by Grid Dynamics. And uh, the topic of our talk today will be interpretable for recasting models. First of all, uh, let me introduce Grid Dynamics. Grid Dynamics is a data science and engineering services company headquartered in Silicon Valley and uh, been in business since 2006. And over that time, we used to work with many retail, manufacturing, technology, and media companies on uh, different innovative programs related to customer intelligence, revenue management, supply chain optimization, and other areas. And in this talk, I'm going to uh, describe some of the techniques and some of the challenges that we were facing in uh, different projects related to revenue management and inventory optimization uh, and other applications of uh, time series forecasting, as well as uh, how we used to solve this, uh, these problems on, on real projects. So I'm going to start with a description of several use cases for um, interpretable forecasting and signal decomposition. I will be using demand forecasting as a running example and will be focusing predominantly on this use case and this domain. Uh, uh, demand forecasting in retail and manufacturing, but also uh, I will uh, touch briefly uh, some other applications that can use uh, similar techniques uh, like uh, causal impact analysis in marketing applications and anomaly detection in IT operations. And after that, uh, we will talk about uh, what interpretability actually means for different uh, users 
in the enterprise. And uh, finally, the main part of this presentation will be a hands-on uh, tutorial, hands-on example that shows how different uh, specific techniques uh, can be used to uh, decompose a time series and how these techniques can be applied in practice to um, our example with demand forecasting problem. So uh, let us start with uh, the problem of uh, demand decomposition and demand for revenue forecasting. So uh, it, typically, when we are talking about revenue optimization or price optimization, uh, the solution for uh, these problems is based on the ability to forecast the demand based on the function of different variables like prices or promotions or competitor prices. And uh, this problem is quite challenging because um, the number of uh, different effects that influence demand on a certain product is relatively high and uh, uh, all these effects need to be modeled correctly and uh, ideally we need to understand the impact of each of these each of these effects. For example, um, if you are, talk if you are uh, talking about some specific item like a coffee machine that we are selling, obviously the demand on this item will depend on its price and can be different components of this price. It can be base price, it can be uh, uh, promoted price or discount. So we need to measure all these effects. But in addition to that, uh, the, the demand on this item can be influenced by uh, some other similar products. So um, consumers can switch uh, from different brands or for alternative products. Uh, uh, back and forth and uh, we also need to measure cross elasticity of our demand on a certain item uh, comparing to uh, based on the prices for similar or substitutable items and it can be done in thin category or cross categories. Uh, it also can be dependencies between related products. For example, if we are selling coffee machines, that uh, the price on coffee machine can influence demand on coffee filters because these are related products and uh, the more uh, people use coffee machines, uh, the more they use coffee filters and so on. So we need to measure this as well. We need to measure cross elasticity for competitor pricing uh, because um, customer can switch from our brand to competitor brand and so on. Uh, we also uh, need to track different temporal dependencies even within uh, a single time series. For example, if we put some product on a discount during holiday season, then uh, people can buy uh, more units or more quantity of this product and it will uh, negatively impact uh, the demand in the future because um, customer can stockpile uh, certain units, especially for um, consumable products and uh, the future demand will be negatively impacted by that. And of course, there are some other external factors, external coverage, like uh, intensity of marketing campaigns, intensity of advertising that can also influence uh, the demand and so on. But unfortunately, we are not able to observe all these factors directly. What we typically able to observe, we able to observe, of course, our sales data, and it can be uh, somewhat limited as well. And uh, we also can observe some pricing information. We can observe, uh, we can get some uh, marketing data, but uh, what we ideally would like to do, uh, we would like to uh, take our sales data and decompose it into uh, these different effects uh, that can include seasonality, that can include own item price uh, elasticity and price response on our uh, own product price or response on um, discount values and also can include cross effects with related products or competitors. And uh, this information needs to be uh, derived from the sales data and needs to be ideally needs to be presented to business users, to price managers, so they can make uh, decisions with regard to price optimization more efficiently and also measure the response, the real outcome of their pricing decisions more accurately because uh, it's generally not a good idea just to ignore cannibalization efforts. You can run some discount that can change your sales volume for a given product, but it can cannibalize demand on other products, and the um, the total uh, the total ROI of this section can be uh, zero or negative, and this is something that uh, we ideally trying to avoid uh, when we build these solutions. So. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the use cases and we will use it as a running example during this presentation, uh, but this is not the only use case, of course, that we need um, 
uh, signal decomposition and interpretability of forecasting models in enterprise applications. Another good example is uh, causal impact analysis for um, uh, marketing actions or for introduction of new products, as it's uh, schematically shown here. So basically, let's say that we have some history of, uh, of our KPIs, for example, sales data within certain category or um, number of conversions, uh, on our website and then we do some marketing action, some intervention, for example, introduce new product or launch a new campaign. And um, we generally interested uh, in measuring the difference, the uplift between no action baseline, which we will not observe uh, and uh, we can either um, somehow measure it using A-B testing or we uh, can use forecasting to estimate how this baseline will look like. Uh, and then we will observe our actual numbers and then we will, uh, we will analyze this difference. But to do so, uh, it's not always possible to do A-B testing properly uh, in, uh, in some applications like new product launch, for example. And um, it can be more preferable to do uh, this forecasting and uh, measure the uplift based on this forecasting. And it generally requires to separate um, normal effects like seasonality and other things from uh, effects induced by, uh, for example, our marketing campaign. And in that case, uh, this essentially boils down to the problem of signal decomposition or uh, to some extent interpretability of our forecast and ability to decompose it into different factors, different components and effects. Another example is anomaly detection. Uh, imagine that you collect multiple metrics uh, from uh, your application or from your infrastructure and you would like to um, send uh, alerts to the operations team uh, in case you detect some abnormal behavior. And this problem generally uh, uh, is very often solved uh, again through uh, special types of forecasting models that uh, we try to forecast uh, how this metric should normally uh, evolve. And then uh, if we have significant difference between this normal uh, behavior, this expected behavior, and uh, what we actually see, then uh, we rise on the limit. And that all, again, it requires to, um, to understand uh, what is normal behavior and uh, what are the regular patterns uh, in, uh, in the observed metrics and separate them from anomalies. So again, the problem can be framed as a, a problem of decomposition uh, or problem of uh, forecast interpretation and ability to uh, properly, uh, properly interpret different components in the forecast and separate uh, them in, in different ways, slice and dice them in a, separate, in, in a certain way. Uh, okay, so uh, these are uh, these are use cases that we will be using during this presentation. And now let's talk about uh, what interpretability actually means for different business users. And again, let's use this de demand decomposition and price optimization use case as an example. From the data scientist perspective, uh, when we are talking about interpretability, typically it means that we have some model, and uh, this model uh, either um, it allows us to directly trace the dependency between changes of certain individual features or group of features and it outputs, or uh, we can use some, um, uh, some techniques like uh, Shapley values to, uh, to essentially estimate the same, uh, the same dependency, but for black box models. And uh, using this analysis, we essentially, for most of the models, we can, um, for example, analyze if we change one of the features, it can be price or can be discount, how it influence our output forecast, uh, for example, our sales forecast. Uh, but this is only part of the story, and this is uh, this interpretation. It can be appealing for data scientists, but actually, um, uh, in our experience, it's not necessarily appealing for price managers or for other business users. And for from the business user's perspective, uh, the interpretation can be substantially different. For example, uh, one typical one typical way how price managers would look at the problem, uh, it's uh, it's a little bit more uh, extended comparing to this uh, basic uh, basic definition of interpretability. Um, again, we can have some uh, some forecasting. Uh, model uh, as the core of our solution that allows to estimate the dependency between, let's say, price and sales data. But at the same time, price managers might be interested in um, 
analyzing impact on uh, on different uh, business metrics like profit, like ROI, like uplift, and it can be quite many of them. It can be tens of different metrics that needs to be analyzed. And this generally requires to build this additional layer of econometric models on top of uh, our core forecasting model to measure all these different effects and measure how um, our input input feature or change in the input feature actually related to uh, changes in this uh, in this business KPIs. And in addition to that, we can actually we might need to um, to build even more uh, even more models on top of that. For example, it's uh, also typical for price managers to compare uh, not just to um, not just to forecast uh, the performance of a given promotion, but to compare performance of this promotion with uh, last year data for a similar promotion or for exactly the same promotion that was executed exactly a year ago, and uh, uh, and do some experiments, some both analysis to see how uh, tweaks in um, in time or tweaks in discount value actually uh, in change uh, this difference comparing to the previous year. So do we do we increase uh, promotion performance by tweaking this variable, so do we decrease it? So uh, in general, uh, it's quite common to build uh, all, this, uh, all this machinery, all this uh, econometrics on top of forecasting models to make, uh, uh, to make our, um, our interpretations in terms of these uh, differences more consumable by business users. Uh, and in many cases, uh, one needs to go even, even beyond that and estimate not just these uh, average numbers, expected numbers, forecasted numbers, but also estimate uh, different statistical properties uh, like confidence intervals or even distributions of these different metrics like profits or ROIs, so uh, that uh, marketing, uh, marketing managers or price managers can make more, um, more intelligent and more uh, uh, more safe decisions taking into account this uh, this uncertainty in the model, and this is uh, another way of uh, another perspective on interpretability is that uh, they they need not uh, only to uh, to understand the dependency between the features and outputs, but also understand uh, these uncertainties associated with the forecast. And uh, in many cases, it can be done by uh, building this pipeline with these forecasting models. Uh, attached to econometric models and running some historical data, for example, previous year data through this pipeline to, um, uh, to essentially generate uh, this empirical distribution of, uh, of our uh, business KPIs. And uh, it typically works, uh, works pretty well and provides uh, good insight in terms of this uncertainty ranges. And it's, uh, it's very well explainable to the business users in most cases. And uh, actually, in reality, if we uh, go even beyond that and we are trying to present um, the results of our analysis or forecasting uh, to the business users in the way that they can uh, quickly uh, do uh, and efficiently do adjustment of their uh, promotion parameters or pricing parameters, then uh, typically um, it is done in the form of some interactive tool that they can uh, change some parameters, for example, as you can see here, like promotion depth and uh, promotion time frame. And uh, uh, if they change it, they can see uh, how it's related, how it is related to the price elasticity. And it can be derived, of course, from our forecasting model. We can forecast uh, minimum possible demand and maximum possible demand uh, based on uh, minimum and maximum valid prices for a certain product and provide some information. What are the elasticity ranges? Uh, for example, elasticity ranges are typically higher during the holiday season rather than other periods of time. So um, uh, price managers can see this information. And it's also uh, important to provide some insights into how individual actions like individual promotions affect long-term outputs, uh, again, because of the, uh, the effects that we just talked about, like cannibalization or pull-forward effects, it can be the case that we can um, achieve uh, 
good results for one product considered in isolation, but uh, our long-term uh, return for entire category can be uh, actually negative because of cannibalization effects, or it can be negative even for this individual product because of pool forward effect. We can essentially pull more demand into this time frame, but in the long run, uh, we will uh, make less profits or less revenues based on that. And um, in practice, um, uh, in practice, the design of these tools is significantly influenced by a specific enterprise, by specific client. Uh, it's very um, because uh, business processes are very different, and uh, questions that are uh, uh, asked by uh, business users are also very different. They might be interested in finding uh, top uh, and top ten. For example, cannibalized skills for a certain product or uh, understanding the demand drivers, what are the positive and negative contributors in the uh, uh, sales, uh, like is it better to change baseline prices, list prices, or uh, discounts, uh, and so on. And uh, typically, it's, uh, it's quite challenging to, uh, even if we have good forecasting models and we're able to estimate these basic uh, dependencies between inputs and outputs in these models, and we're able even to, uh, to estimate different components like cannibalization pull forward, still uh, it's, uh, it's often a challenge to present it to the business users in an efficient way and create tools that can be used uh, efficiently and can be uh, embedded in uh, enterprise processes. Uh, so this is kind of an this was a kind of an overview of um, uh, of uh, what uh, what I mean by uh, interpretability in the context of uh, uh, in the context of um, price management, for example, and it's similar to other enterprise applications. And now let's go into uh, in the hands-on, more technical uh, session that. Uh, uh, we will talk about uh, specific techniques that can be used to produce these different measurements, uh, these different values that quantify all these different effects that can be used to build tools um, uh, like, we, like we just discussed. And uh, uh, we will make uh, this Jupyter notebook that implements this, uh, this, uh, uh, this example available after this webinar. So I will just uh, show uh, essentially some, some screenshots, some plots out of this notebook uh, for, the sake of, uh, for the sake of time. So we can go through it uh, relatively quickly. So uh, in this hands-on example, we will uh, use uh, generated or simulated data that uh, reflect different uh, econometric effects that we discussed. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that we would like to, um, in this example, we would like to understand how different uh, inter uh, interpretation techniques work for different cases. For example, how does it work for, um, uh, for uh, data with cannibalization versus data without cannibalization? And it's quite difficult to do it with real data and demonstrate it quite clearly. But uh, in practice, uh, these techniques uh, can, be, uh, can be very similar. And uh, of course, they, uh, they will not work so perfectly with real data as uh, they will in this uh, simulated, uh, simulated example. But our main goal here is to understand these core concepts and um, uh, see how it can be applied in principle to this type of problems. So uh, our first step is to set up the, uh, our environment, to set up the data, and uh, the way we approach it, we first generate um, what we call here market envelope. So we essentially generate the total demand for, uh, uh, for um, some uh, collection of categories for a long period of time, for five years. And uh, the way we generate it, we uh, have here some trend and we also have some seasonality and we have some correlated noise here added as well. And then we, um, uh, we split this uh, total envelope uh, into demands for uh, two categories. And uh, there is some trend. So initially we start with, we have one uh, category with larger demand and uh, another category with smaller demand. And then the second category uh, grows more rapidly comparing to the first category. So we uh, generate the split uh, with the strands and of course noise. And finally we split each category into two products. So we have four products in total and for uh, uh, all these products we have seasonal effects uh, at the scale of uh, at the scale of quarters and we also have smaller scale seasonality at the level of uh, uh, at the level of uh, 
weeks. So we have some weekly pattern uh, which you can see uh, which you can see here as well for uh, for all uh, for all of these uh, four problems. Okay. Uh, so these are our envelopes, and on the second step for preparing this data, we uh, develop some uh, very simple uh, econometric models that we will apply on top of these envelopes. So we will uh, first, of course, generate uh, some uh, some price series for each of the products. So we change uh, our prices uh, this way uh, over uh, over five years, and uh, we have some price response function defined here. It's very simple. It's a linear function, so you can see here that it is essentially uh, a negative of uh, of the price, the higher the price, the lower the demand, and uh, other way around. And then uh, we also uh, create um, uh, create series that uh, simulate uh, within category and cross category cannibalization. So this series essentially um, uh, proportional to the ratio between a product own price and average price within the category and average price in, uh, in, in, in the other category. And then we also simulate pull forward effect through, um, through generating this shaper that uh, uh, essentially, uh, essentially tells us that we have negative impact on uh, on the demand after we raise the price. So we generally assume that once we raise the price, people uh, start to uh, use uh, the units that they stockpiled in the in the past instead of buying uh, this product in the store. And uh, this effect has some prolonged effect, like 100 days, and it, uh, it, uh, it uh, over time it of course decreases. So we have this uh, this um, uh, the series that models pull forward effect, and then we combine uh, all these uh, all these uh, components into one shaper: uh, price response, cannibalization, and pull forward. And then we uh, apply this shaper to uh, envelopes that we generated on the previous step. So this way, we obtain a sales series that have all these econometric effects as well as trends and seasonality effects that we generated uh, in the previous step. And of course, we can turn on and off these uh, these different components. For example, we can uh, turn on cannibalization and uh, turn off pull forward or uh, turn on both cannibalization and pull forward and then see um, how it changes our, uh, our analysis. And uh, uh, we will do it in a moment. So um, <clears throat> And next, I'm going to talk about uh, three different tools that we can use to analyze a uh, series like that. Uh, these tools are quite different, and uh, they, uh, they're not like perfectly substitutable. They actually complement each other, and in real analysis, it uh, generally makes sense to use, uh, uh, to use uh, uh, maybe two or these three tools together. And of course, this, are, this is not a full list of tools that we can use. There are some other techniques that can also be very helpful. So let's start with uh, first tool, which probably uh, is, is most common, and I'm sure that uh, this technique is generally familiar to, uh, to most of you. So uh, we first use uh, gradient boosted decision trees to, um, to develop the forecasting model. So we use the uh, YGBM or we can use TechGBoost pretty much in the same way to forecast sales uh, of, uh, of products based on features like uh, product ID, category ID, calendar features like day of the week, uh, month, prices, of course, for this product and for other products, and uh, different uh, legs for sales and, and prices. And this way, um, you can see here that we uh, we fit this model uh, reasonably well. This is a seven day ahead forecast that we produced. Uh, we have this uh, time frame for our training as our training data and this time frame as uh, our forecasting uh, or test data. Uh, and once we fit this model, we can use uh, Shep library to, uh, to estimate contribution of different features through uh, uh, through computing shared values for uh, all the features that uh, I input to our model. And uh, here you can see the result of this analysis for four different scenarios. Uh, so we have four different scenarios. In the first one, we uh, have just uh, the seasonal effects without cannibalization and pull forward. Then we turn cannibalization. Uh, in uh, the fourth example, we have only pull forward. And in the fourth example, we have both cannibalization and pull forward turned on. Uh, to generate our series. And the result is, um, is of course, uh, 
very, uh, very expected, very predictable. So if we do not have, uh, for example, cannibalization, then our uh, price, uh, price values for other products in the category uh, or in other category, they score relatively low here. So we do not have much contribution. If we have cannibalization, then of course we are getting uh, this, uh, this values uh, uh, scored much higher and we can see here if it uh, produces some positive uh, impact or negative impact depending on what we have. Do we have cannibalization or do we have halo effect? Um, and this way we can uh, at least quantify uh, the impact of cannibalization uh, to, uh, to a certain extent here. But this is probably not, this is most common representation of, uh, of Shapley value analysis, but this is not the only representation. What we can do uh, alternatively to that, we can uh, actually plot uh, Shapley values for certain features uh, for every time step, because uh, in case of uh, Shep library, we, uh, it returns us, uh, these values for uh, for each time step at for each feature. So here we just squash all these values into, uh, into this scatter plot. Uh, but alternative representation is to uh, just uh, take our um, our time axis and uh, visualize these contributions for every single time step. So here you can see uh, again these four scenarios with different combinations of uh, performance and cannibalization. And uh, let's say if we have only seasonality without these economic effects, then uh, we see that uh, we can plot here these uh, sharp values for sales forecast, and we can uh, plot here this green line product price as well. And we see that uh, product price actually is uh, pretty much the only contributor to uh, uh, to changes of um, uh, of our sales, uh, of our sales numbers, mm -hmm. comparing to uh, prices to other products. In case we have cannibalization, then uh, we can see very clearly that actually prices for all four products they have some contribution to sales data for uh, one certain product. In this way, we can uh, we can. Uh, see uh, more clearly uh, how exactly this dependency evolves over time and how it changes over time. Maybe it can be correlated with uh, holidays or some other events or some other pattern can be can be spotted if we uh, do this analysis. So this generally uh, this generally a, a useful tool to cannibalization analysis, of course. So this is this is one of the techniques that we can use, and it's probably the most uh, uh, the most simple in uh, in application, but this is not uh, the only technique that we can use, of course. Uh, the second uh, the second tool, the second technique uh, I want uh, to talk about is uh, uh, vector autoregressive models. So this technique is actually uh, very uh, uh, I think it's not uh, very uh, very commonly used nowadays in industrial applications, but it uh, it's very uh, very common, uh, probably most common technique used in uh, economic research. Uh, so these models were introduced in uh, uh, in 1980s, and they were designed specifically to analyze uh, multiple uh, multiple series uh, of, of data, like in macroeconomics, it can be uh, GDP and unemployment rates and uh, some other series that jointly evolve over time. And uh, this technique was designed to uh, to provide ability to estimate uh, causal dependencies between multiple time series and um, what we most interested in you know, to estimate the dynamic uh, dynamic response on uh, one of the uh, one of the variables uh, from uh, some some shock in other variables. So let's see how uh, how it works uh, conceptually first. So um, the definition of um, var model is uh, relatively. Uh, uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, we generally assume that for each uh, time step, we have a vector of observed variables. Uh, uh, and uh, in our case, it will be a vector of, of four values, like sales values for four uh, products. And then uh, uh, we essentially model this, uh, this, uh, this value, this vector of this for a certain time step as a, a combination of uh, values for previous uh, P timestamps and P is a hyperparameter of the model. So we have these uh, P uh, matrices with coefficients and these matrices, they are time invariant. And in addition to that, we have this error term or uh, this uh, sometimes called innovation, something that we end on top of it. 
uh, that does not account, that does not that does not feed uh, these uh, these first terms, and uh, one of the key advantages of our model is that we can actually estimate uh, this uh, this dependency between these error terms and uh, how observed variables and uh, between different pairs of them. So we can see how uh, one error from uh, one of the series, uh, one innovation in one of the series, impacts. Um, development of, uh, of another variable. And this way we are able to establish dependencies uh, uh, between, between uh, different uh, variables that we have in the model. And this dependency can be quantified, uh, even more importantly, this dependency can be quantified in, uh, in dynamics. So it's not just a single number, but uh, it is it, uh, what is called uh, impulse response function. So um, Basically, what impulse response function is, uh, is that if we have uh, some change in one of the variables, for example, in price, just one single impulse, uh, like a short term uh, uh, unit change, then uh, the VAR model can provide us insight into uh, uh, how each uh, how it changes the dynamics of other variables, for example, of, uh, of sales. So here, uh, in this example, uh, this is just a, just a sketch, but the idea here is that if we uh, rise prices for just a short period of time, then people can start to switch to some other brands or some other effects can, uh, can take place, and uh, the response actually can be somewhat prolonged, and uh, it can uh, change our demand uh, for a relatively long period of time until things stabilize. And we are generally interested in quantifying these dynamics as well, uh, because uh, it's obviously related to effects like pull forward, but it also can help to estimate other aspects of, um, uh, of, uh, of the data we, we are trying to analyze and consumer behavior. So um, here uh, we have an example that was generated uh, of this impulse response functions that was generated from, uh, from the same data we used in the previous example uh, in the following way. So uh, first of all, VAR model assumes that the data is, uh, um, it does make some assumptions regarding data stationarity uh, and uh, some other properties of, uh, of the series that we are trying to analyze. So uh, in order to uh, make um, our time series compliant with this, uh, we, uh, uh, what we do here, we actually feed uh, some low capacity uh, gradient boosted decision tree model first, and then subtract uh, predictions of this model from uh, our time series, and then apply our model to this uh, residual data. And uh, as you can see here, what we, uh, what we are getting out of this analysis, we can see that, uh, first of all, uh, the response, uh, impulse response function between product own price and product sales values, it's, uh, uh, it very clearly indicates the presence of pull forward effect. So we are not getting uh, like the, this long uh, exponential proof that uh, you might remember we had in the original shaper because we already applied um, um, our low capacity GBM model to subtract uh, some seasonal patterns and uh, other things that we do not need in the VAR model. Uh, but generally it's possible to, uh, to quantify uh, this, uh, this time effects using this technique uh, quite clearly and uh, it's, uh, it provides us with, uh, with quite clear differentiation between um, series with and without pull forward effect. And uh, actually for cannibalization, we, uh, uh, we can obtain uh, the same insight uh, through uh, measuring uh, impulse response function between price of one product and sales data for another product. And here you can see that if we do not have cannibalization factor in into our data generator, then uh, this dependency is essentially uh, negligible. We do not have uh, the magnitude of this dependency is very low. We have just noise. But if we uh, uh, really have cannibalization, then we have much higher magnitude and uh, we can see how, uh, how um, price of one product influence uh, sales on another product and potentially we can do this analysis to see the actual dynamics like or how long lasting this effect is. Uh, so uh, in general, this is, uh, this is a very useful tool and not only for this impulse response analysis, but also for analysis of other uh, causal dependencies between uh, different time series, between uh, product uh, sales data in particular. Uh, 
And uh, the third technique that I wanted to talk about is uh, Bayesian structural time series, uh, which, is, uh, which is a kind of an emerging technique. It was introduced uh, uh, relatively recently, or at least it, uh, it was introduced to uh, industrial practitioners uh, relatively recently. And uh, I think the popularity of this technique generally grows. Uh, so uh, let's talk about it. So uh, this technique is based on traditional uh, Bayesian hierarchical models that uh, are used uh, in, in many applications, in particular in uh, uh, economic research, in uh, medical research for a very long time. And uh, I just want to, um, uh, to, quickly, uh, uh, to quickly summarize what Bayesian hierarchical models uh, are about. So, um, in general, uh, in general, this approach uh, is uh, is about uh, defining a certain uh, model with a certain structure uh, and inferring this model uh, parameters of this model uh, based on uh, observed data in uh, Bayesian way. And uh, for example, uh, let's say that we observe some uh, some uh, ROI numbers for uh, for different uh, uh, locations. Uh, of uh, of our enterprise, for example, for different stores, and it's uh, uh, in this example, this is not time series. This is just let's say some monthly numbers or some annual numbers that we observe, and we make some assumptions uh, about the process that generates this data. For example, for simplicity here, this is a very simplistic example. Of course, we can um, assume that this data is generated by some normal uh, normal process. They have normal distribution. Uh, but in addition to that, we can make an assumption that actually uh, these numbers, they can depend on uh, location, for example, on state or on country this data comes from. And uh, this will essentially uh, uh, some latent variable that we do not observe or might not observe explicitly. We might not have this uh, country or state tag in our data. Let's assume that. And, um, uh, essentially, uh, our, our observed uh, numbers will be a mix of, uh, of different normal processes with different means. And we can assume that uh, these means are generated by some other random process. Let's uh, again assume that this is a normal process uh, defined on top of, of the first one. Right? In that case, uh, uh, our data generation process is supposed to be as follows. We take our normal distribution, this one initially, generate some mean, then generate a number of samples here, then take another mean from this distribution, generate more samples in here. And uh, our goal, uh, once we are trying to fit this model, our goal is to estimate uh, the distribution of, uh, uh, of our model parameters, uh, this, uh, this hidden variables that we do not uh, that we do not actually uh, observe, we just assume that they structurally uh, should be present based on some common considerations, right? And uh, we can estimate the distribution of these parameters based on data, and then we can, of course, uh, estimate uh, the distribution of, uh, of uh, the data that we observe and make some forecasts, generate more samples based on, based on this distribution. And in case we apply the same approach for time series analysis, uh, uh, the concept will stay the same, but the model, of course, will be more sophisticated. Essentially, we can, um, uh, what we normally would do, uh, we, uh, we will have some, some data, like uh, let's say our sales data, and we will have some cover rates like uh, that we observe explicitly, for example, our price numbers. But we also can assume that there are some hidden latent processes that evolve according to their own trajectories, but we do not observe them directly. For example, it can be something related to seasonality, it can be some cycles in the data, it can be trends. We do not really know if these uh, cycles or trends present in the data. We uh, need to estimate these parameters that will take tell us uh, if they actually present or these parameters are like zero and uh, this uh, effects are not present, and we define some uh, uh, some some laws according to which these uh, hidden processes evolve over time, and then uh, we fit this model uh, using our data, and we uh, estimate uh, distributions of these different parameters, and it enables us to estimate the distribution of our output data provided uh, this model structure and these parameters, and uh, it essentially enables us uh, in turn to forecast. Uh, future values and forecast the distribution of these future values. And also, uh, if we estimate these parameters, we can decompose our observed time series into these different components that correspond to seasonality or trends or some other 
some other uh, effects that we uh, assume to be present in, in the data. And uh, there are different ways how it can be implemented. There are a number of uh, probabilistic programming libraries uh, in uh, relatively recently uh, uh, TensorFlow, um, TensorFlow probability added uh, their own implementation of uh, structural time series, uh, which uh, probably one of the one of the most convenient tools uh, available now for these purposes. Uh, so here you can see an example of how we define um, our uh, BSTS model for uh, analysis of the data we used in the previous examples. So we essentially, uh, this definition uh, in a nutshell is very straightforward. We can define some seasonal effects like day of the week effect, month of the year effect, trends, price effects as a, as a essentially linear regression, and then uh, model our output time series as a sum of these of this different effects. Uh, of course, in reality, it's, uh, it's more, in real applications, it's more complicated than that because we need to care about uh, some other things we need to care about hyperparameters, about priors to do that, but um, uh, still uh, it's, it's a very convenient way of uh, defining our forecasting model. And then what we can generate out of that, uh, we can take our uh, sales series and we can take our price uh, data as well because we observed them explicitly and run it through this model and produce this decomposition of our sales data. And typically it's, it works uh, reasonably well in the sense that it's able to uh, forecast this daily patterns, uh, monthly patterns. Here you can see that we also identified uh, trend reasonably well. It's still uh, there is some leak of, uh, of seasonal data into this trend, but uh, it's uh, it's relatively smooth. Um, and uh, also here we have uh, estimation of how different prices on different products contribute into uh, into how absurd sales data and also how uh, price uh, sales lag contributes uh, into uh, absurd data as well, so that uh, uh, so that we can uh, we can use it to estimate our pull forward effect here and uh, we also get in because this is a Bayesian technique we also get in our posterior distribution for uh, for all these parameters and here you can see these uh, blue zones uh, they correspond to uh, our uncertainty uncertainty ranges for this data and this is also of course very helpful because uh, we can see here not just uh, our average forecast but we also can get some idea of how uh, accurate this forecast is or how accurate our uh, our analysis of these different components is, and uh, uh, this this is uh, this is obviously a very very interesting tool, relatively new, and uh, in general we are trying to use it uh, uh, more uh, more extensively and more intensively uh, going forward uh, instead of using uh, more traditional techniques uh, like uh, like Sharpie value that they shown in the uh, in the first uh, in the first example, so. Uh, now let me uh, conclude this presentation with uh, a brief summary on what are the main practical challenges in, uh, in using all these techniques. The first uh, major challenge is of course the problem of scalability because uh, in this example uh, we did analysis uh, for a very uh, like a very very toy example with just four products but of course uh, forecasting uh, Mm -hmm. Doing forecasts and doing interpretation of this forecast for four products is very different from doing it for uh, 400 products, for example. And uh, uh, because if we have uh, too many products, then uh, we will have uh, a lot of noise in this data and contribution of each individual product, of course, will be uh, like relatively, uh, relatively low and so on. So it's quite difficult to separate signal from noise in that case. And the way how uh, we can work around it, we uh, there are different ways. Uh, quite uh, quite oftenly, uh, people start with uh, manually defined cannibalization groups, so uh, just using domain knowledge and uh, experience. Uh, price managers and analysts they can group products into some reasonable groups and make assumptions that there is no dependency between these groups, but there is dependency within uh, each group. 
And then uh, this, uh, of course, the disadvantage of this approach is that it needs to be manually done, and uh, we can do uh, generally better than that through defining some uh, automatic uh, distance metrics between the products, or similarity measures between the products based on product descriptions, uh, attributes, uh, sales information, and this way we can generate these groups in an automated way. But uh, this, this is, uh, I would say, this is a large problem. Um, uh, in itself, and uh, we can spend quite quite a lot of time talking about uh, how exactly this part can be can be handled. Uh, the second. Uh uh, large challenge is, of course, the lack of data and uh, lack of variability in the data. For example, uh, it's quite common uh, in many applications that, uh, in many enterprises, that only uh, a relatively small subset of products is actively promoted or actively managed, and uh, for uh, remaining products, there are no uh, much promotion information. Uh, these products can be put on promotions very rarely or never at all, and uh, it's quite difficult to, uh, of course, in that situation to estimate how uh, promotions or some other changes in prices can influence uh, revenues from these products. And uh, this problem can be partly alleviated again through uh, similarity analysis between the products, but uh, in some cases one needs to do experimentation and collect more data uh, for uh, at least certain products uh, selected in a certain way to uh, make this analysis uh, possible and accurate enough. Uh, the third challenge uh, that uh, uh, we already talked about is uh, how we can uh, present uh, the results of our analysis to business users in uh, an efficient way. And uh, it's, of course, very important because we can uh, develop a very good uh, forecasting model. We can develop excellent, uh, uh, excellent uh, inter interpretability tools uh, using, uh, for example, some of the methods that we talked about. But if we fail to communicate it to business users efficiently, they uh, will uh, just abandon uh, the tool and uh, the business outcome, the final business outcome will be, uh, will be zero for a project like that. And uh, by this reason, it's very important to, uh, to understand uh, the business metrics, to understand uh, how business processes work and how uh, this insights generated uh, out of the models can actually be used uh, in these business processes to efficiently adjust promotion parameters, to efficiently adjust prices, and uh, to what makes sense and what does not make sense for uh, business users like uh, price managers and how this information can be summarized efficiently and presented to them and uh, uh, essentially packaged as some interactive tool that they can do their analysis and observe uh, some forecasts for business KPIs and so on. Uh, and finally, uh, the, uh, the fourth challenge, uh, also very important, is, uh, is validation of, uh, of these different insights and forecasts. Uh, when we are doing this modeling, we, uh, in most cases, we of course can do some basic validation using historical data, using cross-validation test sets and so on, but it's not always possible to, um, uh, to validate uh, all the things just based on historical data. Um, or it can be uh, very challenging or unreliable to do so. And uh, from that perspective, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, I would say, it's always a good idea to incorporate some production uh, testing or some trials, uh, real life trials into, into the project roadmap and start to do these uh, first validations as, uh, as early as possible so that uh, we can actually um, um, make some, some real business decisions, at least at a small scale, using uh, initial outputs of our models and uh, uh, execute these decisions and collect some feedback data and make adjustments to our, uh, to our solution uh, as, uh, as early as possible in, uh, in, in uh, solution development lifecycle. So all these aspects uh, in practice are very, uh, very important. And this is, of course, not the full list of challenges. Uh, but uh, in general, these decomposition techniques, they play a very important uh, and uh, probably increasingly important role in, uh, in enterprise applications because uh, black box models, of course, uh, uh, represent uh, a lot of uh, a lot of issues, a lot of challenges for business users, and at the same time, development of good interpretability uh, uh, interpretability tools uh, capabilities is also not straightforward, as uh, as, as we've seen uh, through this through this presentation. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for your participation.